Hi, and welcome to the X-22 Report Spotlight. Today, we have a returning guest, Jason Burak. He is an investor, an entrepreneur, financial historian, and an Austrian school economist. Jason co-founded the startup investor education, a financial education company called Wall Street for Main Street. He has his YouTube channel, Wall Street for Main Street. And I am very happy to have him back on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Jason, welcome back to the Spotlight. Thanks, Dave. Happy July 4th, and I'm glad to be back on. Hey, happy July 4th to you, and thanks for coming back on. And let's start right off with the head of the Fed, Janet Yellen. She came out and she made this statement where she says, I don't believe we will see another financial crisis in our lifetime. Do you believe her? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, this has so much hubris. This is this is the typical arrogant bureaucrat, central banker, uh, let's go back through history. This reminds me a lot of what uh, Yale economist and prof Yale professor Irving Fisher said mere months before the October 1929 Black Tuesday stock market crash. Irving Fisher, for those of your listeners who are not familiar, said stocks have reached a permanently high plateau. And so and in uh, other examples of this with hubris from either the intelligent intelligentsia academia or arrogant central bankers is go back on YouTube and watch the comments that Ben Bernanke before he became chairman of the Federal Reserve made 2005 2006 2007 about the real estate market and subprime. Uh, he says, to summarize some of his comments, he said the economy has extremely strong fundamentals, the economy is doing well to justify high real estate prices, and that subprime is contained, and that housing prices have never all gone down universally in, uh, across the country all at once. And we all know what happened after that. We know how Alan Greenspan got out. He knew he had created the uh, real estate bubble, and we knew that Alan Greenspan got out before the blame. So I'm thinking this on Janet Yellen's part, not only did she say, she didn't say her lifetime, Dave, and some people are thinking that she said her lifetime. I went back and read the comments. She said our lifetime, like the people in the audience, the person interviewing her who was much younger, she said our lifetime. So they think they've solved everything. Uh, I think Janet Yellen is one of three things. She's either crazy and delusional. She's lost all her marbles. She's either totally lying or... She's totally brainwashed and she believes all the Keynesian Kool-Aid that GDP is good, is doing well. Uh, inflation is extremely low with the CPI and that uh, unemployment is at record level low lows and that the economy is creating jobs. So it might be a combination of all three of those things. I do not think she is stupid. I have actually spoken with PhD Keynesian economists. I don't think they're stupid. I think they're book smart and uh, they choose, a lot of them have never worked a real job in their life. I'm not a, a lot of them have never even worked on Wall Street. They just have no semblance of reality. They believe all their Keynesian models, all the government numbers and, and economic statistics, they believe the fake, the economic fake news propaganda. Uh, Jim Chanos, who's, uh, who has one of the best long-term track records on Wall Street, he said that a lot of the economic data is fake economic data that's come out. So uh, it, it's really interesting that, you know, we have this, uh, uh, what Janet Yellen said with her comments, Dave, uh, I saw her press conference a couple weeks ago after she announced the last quarter point interest rate increase. And I think Janet Yellen already has one foot out the door at the Federal Reserve. I think she knows that there's going to be a crash in the next couple of years. I don't think she knows exactly when. Uh, she knows that her and her other central bankers at the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the People's Bank of China, all those, guy, uh, all those guys have printed up massive amounts of digital money and credit and put them into asset markets, derivatives and other things to delay the next financial crisis. And just like Ben Bernanke did, she wants to get out before the, cr the next crash so it's not blamed on her and she can deflect it. And then her... She can go back to either academia with her husband, her and her husband together have three or four pensions, very high, uh, very high salary pension, six figure pensions, each pension. And then she can go on the Ben Bernanke type of deal where she makes six to seven figures for consulting for consulting work for hedge funds. She gets huge speaking fees uh, for businesses and Wall Street 
and investment banks and hedge funds. And then she gets a six or seven book deal, how she had to deal with Donald Trump for a while. So I, I don't think Janet Yellen will be the Federal Reserve chair after February or March. I think she'll probably be gone by then. Uh, that's what it sounded like in her press conference that uh, that uh, she thinks that she's uh, delayed the next crisis enough to get out and not be the bag holder. Now, what's very interesting is that the biz, now they came up with a completely different report saying that the main cause of the next recession will perhaps resemble more closely that of the latest one, a financial cycle bust. So the biz right now looks like they're reporting that there's going to be another crisis headed our way. Okay, well, I think the absolute best case scenario going forward is a lot worse stagflation. And if the central bankers if they do more intervention, if they misread a bubble and they, uh, you know, blow something else up or take money away at the wrong time, you know, it could be a lot worse than 2008 or, uh, you know, down the line, we could have an enormous, enormous currency crisis with multiple currencies, not just with the U.S. dollar, um, because ev no one wants a strong currency and everyone's trying to take turns coordinating, coordinating devaluations. Uh, you know, the people who are saying only the dollar is going to crash are totally wrong. All these currencies are intentionally being devalued. They're trying to hide it. They've managed to put the majority of the inflation uh, into the asset markets instead of the real economy. So there is double digit inflation in the real economy right now, according to Ed Batowski's Chapwood Inflation Index. If you live in a major U.S. city or right outside of a major U.S. city, you are getting 10 percent or more inflation per year every year for the last five years. Uh, I want to put that in perspective. If you have a 10% inflation rate, Dave, that means in 7.2 years, because there's the rule of 72. So in 7.2 years with a 10% inflation rate, your standard of living will be cut in half. And the government statistics are not reflecting this. This is not reality what the government is reporting. The other thing I wanted to bring up with Janet Yellen saying no financial crisis is that I, I think it's really interesting how, you know, the real economy is basically collapsing. We are seeing, seeing stagflation. There's record amounts of retail stores at closing. There's uh, projected to be over 8,000 large chain U.S. retail stores closing by the end of 2017 this year alone. And that's, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not more jobs. And the funny thing, Dave, go back for your listeners who uh, a, a lot of people don't like to research the past that much. But I think, you know, if you use history in the past, you can predict the future. Go back and look at the articles and the videos of uh, peep talking heads from the mainstream financial media, talking heads from Wall Street, talking heads from Federal Reserve governors, Ben Bernanke, people from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. After the 2008 financial crisis, they were touting how the economy was recovering, Dave, and they said almost all the new jobs the government was claiming, and all those people I mentioned, that almost all the new jobs that have been created were from restaurants and retail. Well, what's been happening in the last 12 to 18 months in restaurants and retail? They're collapsing. Yeah. Right. They're collapsing. They're collapsing. So no one's talking about this. They're just talking about the low uh, unemployment rate. They're not talking about how all the jobs that were supposedly created and they weren't really created. We know that the birth death model actually created most of the fake jobs after 2008 financial crisis. Michael Snyder, I think, said that 93 percent uh, of the jobs were fake from the birth death model. They were assumed into existence. They were not actually reality jobs. And uh, a lot of them, a lot of the jobs that were actually created are only part time jobs, which were counted as full time jobs. So uh, I think, you know, there's the, the, the thing about stagflation that makes it the worst of both worlds is that you don't have the wage growth inflation. So, you know, during the 70s, when there was stagflation last time, people actually, their employers were somewhat generous and gave them some wage increases. And yes, you had to pay a higher mortgage, but your employers were aware there was, because there was more honest inflation statistics. And so people actually got some uh, wage increases uh, from their employers. That's not going to happen this time. People are struggling on Main Street to find full-time jobs. Uh, a lot of people are trying to put together a living, you know, with multiple part-time jobs or a full-time job and a couple part-time jobs just to pay their student loan debt and other things. So, uh, yeah, I think the comments you made, though, about the biz, uh, I think what that means, though, is that we're towards the very end of a credit cycle. So I think almost everyone on Wall Street, even people who are long stocks at this point, would acknowledge that the real economy 
is towards the very, very end of a credit cycle. And we haven't had, this is actually a record amount of time for the US not having a recession uh, since the last recession. So we're long overdue for a government statistical recession. Now, I know that the real economy after 2008 financial crisis had never really recovered, but I'm talking using the government statistics. So um, there's going to be a, a recession even using the government's phony data in the near future. Jason, I just want to clear something up. When you say we're at the end of a credit cycle, what do you mean by that? And and does that how does it affect people? Okay, so so for a credit cycle, it's it's a boom and a bust with the Austrian cycle, but that's not the way people on Wall Street will talk about it. Normally what that means is the credit's going to start declining. So what we see in the real economy, Dave, is we see that Capital One Bank has had now record credit card defaults. Okay, they've had big spikes now the last quarter or two in credit card defaults. Uh, that means then that Capital One Bank and other credit card issuers are going to start either not issuing as many credit cards to people or they're going to start reducing the amount of credit lines available to people. So you're going to see things like that uh, with the credit cycle. You know, the other thing is uh, pro uh, student loan debts may uh, may start to decrease now. People may not get as uh, easy credit for student loans. And uh, we also have with the auto loans, that is an enormous bubble. Literally almost anyone with a pulse has gotten an auto loan the last couple of years. And that's just because there, there's been a huge oversupply with a lot of the car companies. They've made way too many cars. A lot of the car companies, Dave, have been willing to sell the cars, either break even price or even at a loss just to get the car off the dealership lot. And sometimes, you know, if you can... If you can sell the car at a paper loss initially and you put financing on it, you could actually make more profit at the back end, assuming people make their payments. But people then have negative equity. So the car value is going to going to fall faster. So um, what that means then is that a lot of the credit that was available the last X number of years after the 2008 financial crisis, whether that's commercial real estate, um, you know, other areas that use a lot of debt. Uh, those things are going to decline. The amount of credit available for those uh, industries and businesses is going to decline. So we are getting towards the end. You're not going to see big spikes probably in auto loans going forward. Uh, auto, The auto industry is really starting to sputter. It's It's been in major trouble for the last couple quarters, and it's probably going to get a lot worse. And uh, restaurants and retail are other ones because there's a lot of restaurants that have used the uh, the debt markets to grow, to overgrow, those things are in trouble as well. So the Fed came out with a report saying, and this is their stress tests on the banking system, and they said 34 banks passed and they're okay. Now, first of all, do you believe these stress tests? Does this mean the banks are strong? The the banks were the banks were given more capital, but there's st the the banks don't just keep the money docked. So they can they can keep some money there. Uh, at the Federal Reserve, and then they can start using it as collateral to start making derivatives bets, to start making you know all kinds of crazy loans, uh, and so the money can be hypothecated and rehypothecated a bunch of different times. And this is just how fractional reserve banking works. Once you have collateral in the system, you can start leveraging it up. So uh, I don't think you know the research that the the people at the Federal Reserve and others that are saying you know they pass the stress test. I don't think that's really true. If that were true, Dave, why would the central banks then be drastically expanding their balance sheet? I remember I was on your program last year talking about the European banking crisis. And why hasn't Deutsche Bank in the other year? Now, we do have some bank failures in Europe and they, uh, some of the banks are being nationalized, but there should have been a lot more. And Deutsche Bank was one of the main ones that was in the most trouble. There's also a lot of German banks and French banks that are in trouble with bad loans all over Europe. Why haven't we seen these banks you know, go bankrupt? With bailouts yet, uh, with you know actually announcing that the bank is the bank is bankrupt and that there's going to be uh, you know they're going to go through bankruptcy proceedings or some kind of bailout. And I think the answer is that the central banks behind the scenes have been delaying having to announce bailouts publicly, and there's been more of these covert bailouts. Uh, and so when you look at the balance sheets of the central banks, the European Central Bank, Dave, in the last couple of years their balance sheet has exploded. It's actually larger now than the Federal Reserve stated balance sheet. The European Central Bank has 4.5 trillion in assets on their balance sheet. 
They've been buying up European government bonds and European corporate bonds, probably also bailing out a good amount of the banks. The Bank of Japan's balance sheet is now over $4 trillion in U.S. dollar terms. The Bank of England's balance sheet is now over $3 trillion in U.S. dollar terms. And England's economy is nowhere near as big as all of the European Union and of the United States. Same thing for Japan's economy. And yet their balance sheets are not that much smaller than the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. So I think what you've seen is the central bankers ha ha do not, because of public backlash, and people, you know, remember in 2008, we were almost to levels of pitchforks uh, with Main Street people waking up. You had the Occupy Wall Street movement, people, you know, protesting, uh, almost getting violent outside of banks. And so to delay this, the central bankers have gone to covert backdoor bailouts with currency swaps and expanding their balance sheets to buy assets. But this is just insane. There's over 18 trillion in assets, and I'm using air quotes now, that central banks have bought. The People's Bank of China may have to do an even larger bailout than any of the other countries. Okay, they've put 28 trillion, and this goes into the credit, the long, the end of the credit cycle. China has put, Dave, since the 2008 financial crisis, they've been one of the main things reflating the global economy, and they reflated commodity prices for a while. They put 28 trillion in RMB, and that's just an estimate. No one has the exact number because a lot of the banks uh, in China are not uh, private sector banks. They're actually state-owned banks. They're owned by the Chinese government or and backed by the Chinese government. 90% of the banks are. So, uh, it's estimated that there's been 28 trillion in RMB put into the Chinese economy. And that money has leaked out too, uh, due to whatever reasons, into real estate markets all over the country. So you have bubbles everywhere. I call them economic landmines now because if the, the, if the bubble or economic landmine blows up, it could set off a chain reaction. And so the central bankers, what they've done to delay the next 2008 financial crisis is just expand their balance sheet, lie that there's no inflation. And that's why you have this huge divergence between the real economy on Main Street and what's happening with Dow over 21,000, uh, you know, the bond market. A lot of people still think it's in a bull market. It's been in an artificial bull market for over 35 years. You have the real estate prices in a lot of major cities for residential real estate are soaring. Uh, San Francisco, I've read articles recently that there's Google employees that can't even afford to live in San Francisco anymore. That's crazy considering some of their salaries. And there's a commercial real estate bubble that uh, due to Dodd-Frank, one of the unintended consequences uh, the, the politicians thought that they could stop the banks from trading too much. Well, the banks didn't just hold on to the money. The banks, instead of just holding on to the money, like maybe the politicians and the central bankers and the other regulators, banking regulators, and there's all these regulatory agencies that are supposedly in charge of financial industry and the banks, uh, thought that the banks would just hold the money. Well, that's not what happened. So the banks have been putting, since they were blocked from putting as much into trading, they put a lot of that money into commercial real estate since the 2008 financial crisis. And now there's uh, another bubble in commercial real estate in the United States. So, um, you know, all these things, all these credit bubbles that I've outlined, Dave, are not sustainable. On top of this, and this might be one of the largest bubbles of them all, not only in the United States do you have the unfunded liability crisis, you also now have huge pension fund crisis all over the United States, actually all over the globe. Uh, it's estimated that by 2050, the pension fund crisis is, uh, globally will be underfunded by over 300 trillion. Okay, over 300 trillion. And that's despite record high asset prices that were artificially inflated by global central bankers in a coordinated effort. What happens then when the asset prices don't continue going uh, artificially higher inflated levels and they actually have a correction or crash and they go back to normal levels? So this this uh this pension fund crisis may end up being one of the bigger crises out of all of them and there's a lot of central bankers and politicians that have really no clue about it and the politicians you know attitude towards this Dave is like the politicians in Illinois like uh oh no problem we'll just raise taxes 33% on Illinois state residents because of our pension fund liability uh unfunded liabilities and uh you know well everything will work out well People aren't going to sit there and take that type of tax increase. People are going to move. People are going to move. People are going to figure out ways around this. 
the politicians and bureaucrats, they, they are way too much like Wesley Mouch. And it's, it's, it's dystopian that they think that they can just shove more inflation and taxes down our throats and we were not going to do anything about it. That's true. I mean, look at Connecticut. I mean, we have a uh, Hartford Insurance, uh, Aetna, I should say, moving out of there. We have a lot of hedge funds, investment companies moving out of Connecticut. So you can see when you start raising taxes and you start doing these things, companies say, OK, we're out. People say, OK, I'm out. And this is exactly what's going to happen. Exactly. They're either those those hedge funds are going to move to Nevada or Florida. They're going to move to the Caribbean. They're going to move to Puerto Rico now. Uh, Puerto Rico uh, basically has uh, no capital gains taxes, I think, on hedge funds. So you can you can move your hedge fund down there on paper. I think, uh, oh man, I forgot the, John Paulson. I think the hedge fund manager, John Paulson, did that a while ago. And, you know, the New York mainstream financial media in New York started blasting him, but people aren't going to, it's just the rational move to make. People are not going to sit there and let the politicians and bureaucrats you know, shear them like sheep forever. Okay, maybe for a while people let them get away with it. But unless you're like a hardcore Democrat or communist who hates capitalism and believes everyone should be taxed, you know, almost 100 percent and full wealth redistribution, if you're you believe in capitalism and somewhat free markets, you're going to start making preparation to save yourself from these taxes. So um, unfortunately, Dave, I see more inflation, more currency devaluation coming, more taxes coming. Uh, to make up for these pension fund shortfalls. And, um, you know, if the asset prices do drop, you know, there's going to be there's going to be a lot of uh, really bad policies that come out, a lot of panic policies that the politicians and bureaucrats are going to try to pass. And, uh, you know, maybe it'll wake more people up, but it's it's going to anger the people. I just wanted to go back to the um, central banks, their their balance sheets, because the Fed, as we know, they're raising the rate like a quarter a point each time. And the Fed came out and said they're going to start unwinding their balance sheet. What's your take on them unwinding and why did they decide to do it now? Uh, It's a very good question. I don't think that they can meaningfully reduce their balance sheet. So by by meaningfully reduce, I don't think that they can knock off a trillion or two. I don't think they can. Uh, in, In fact, I think, you know, Things are accelerating, and I think there's going to be have to, uh, there's going to have to be more bank bailouts in the near future. Uh, I don't know if they're going to publicly announce these things because, like I said, there was a huge European banking crisis uh, tw- eight, uh, twelve to eighteen months ago that was just exploding, and then we didn't hear a lot of bank failures about it. Now, obviously, there's been a few that have been nationalized, like the Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine nationalized their bank. Italy, I think, just nationalized one of their banks. There's going to have to be more of that. So uh, I I think in the whole scheme of things, I don't think any central bank is going to be able to fully unwind their balance sheet. Here's the thing, though, Dave. So if the Federal Reserve reduces their balance sheet, but the other central banks that they're coordinating with increase their balance sheet, does that mean the Federal Reserve really reduced their balance sheet or as a whole? What this means, uh, my point is that as American taxpayers And American citizens, we have lost our sovereignty. The rule of law is shit. And we now have central bankers who think that they know what's best and are coordinating things behind the scenes that, okay, the U.S. is saying this song and dance, this propaganda to people that they're going to reduce their balance sheet. Uh, We're going to put on this kabuki theater in public to pretend that they're going to sell some assets. But here is the European Central Bank still expanding their balance sheet like crazy. Here is the Bank of England expanding their balance sheet. Here's Japan expanding their balance sheet. Here's China. So, um, you know, if they're doing this, if this continues where these other central banks drastically expand their balance sheets in coordination with the Federal Reserve, we know they're talking at least once a month. There's meetings at the Bank of International Settlements and conference calls. We know it. Okay. So the people are saying this is a conspiracy theory. We know they have meetings. We've seen we've seen them release uh, documents uh, showing that they have conference calls and meetings in Switzerland about this and talking about the financial crisis. So um, I, I think there's going to be rules changes. So if if there is any reduction in the balance sheet, the Fed cannot really reduce their balance sheet. None of these central banks can. This is this is the problems that they've done. You cannot solve a debt problem with more debt. And this is what they've done. They've thrown more more money and credit into the system in a system that's already slogged down with too much debt. So, uh, you know, I think we're going to have to have a global financial reset in the near future. 
I don't I don't want to give exact times, but I think the next global financial crisis will probably be in two to three years. We'll see if they try to patchwork things together uh, just to keep the same system or if they try to overhaul the thing completely. Now, when you say a complete global economic reset, are, are you talking about a new currency? Uh, I would prefer not a one world currency. Uh, I do not like I'm uh, not John Maynard. <laughs> I'm uh, just saying a, 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 something completely different than the dollar. I mean, will the dollar be the reserve currency? I mean, w when you. So I, I would prefer a free market solution to this with competing currencies. Let the people decide if they want to use Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency or gold or silver, whatever is best in the marketplace. Uh, what the central planners, the central bankers, the politicians want is they are planning for this SDR bullshit, which is a basket of currencies. The dollar will still have a lot of power then. Uh, that's why China uh, moved to get the uh, RMB into the SDR uh, to, so they can reliquify the system and kind of keep moving things on with a very similar system. The SDR wouldn't be a total overhaul of the, the system as is. It would just be a new liquidity pump to allow them to start reissuing you know, uh, hundreds of billions or trillions in new SDR bonds and other garbage so they could start using those as collateral again like they've been using US treasuries as collateral to start doing all these financial games. The people in power have different goals than people like you and me. So what I'm trying to do is just make it aware that we shouldn't want them to set up this system this way with the SDR uh, and or reissuing a new dollar. But you know I think that's what the people in power want where they can blame, oh, it was capitalism's fault why all this happened. And, uh, you know, now we're going to go to more regulations and more taxes, and we're just going to reissue another currency and just blame everything on capitalism. I think that's that's what a lot of people in power want to do. Do you think, I mean, you're talking about the SDR. Now, that that's at a higher level, right? Because people wouldn't be trading or using SDRs. Exactly. The, the, SDR, the SDR would essentially replace uh, the dollar standard right now all over the globe. So the US, the uh, all, the global economy is essentially on a dollar standard now, and there's trillions and trillions of excess dollars and US treasuries floating around that are used for collateral and rehypothecation and leverage and all types of financial games that the very sophisticated uh, global financial elites and economic players can use. So the SDR would just replace that. Uh, but you know, there's, there's literally, the US's best export has been dollars. There's literally trillions of dollars, many trillions sitting offshore that a lot of governments have stockpiled. And even, you know, in countries like Venezuela and Zimbabwe, they're not using gold and silver. I mean, maybe they're starting to use Bitcoin now. Uh, but, you know, they on boots on the ground during a hyperinflation in those scenarios, they're they're they want their hands on dollars so that relative to their own currency, the dollar looks better. But. If you understand, you know, how much the dollar has been devalued since the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, it's lost 97% of its purchasing power. So, uh, but on a relative basis compared to the hyperinflation that Venezuela has, the dollar looks great. So um, it's, it, it's a complicated situation. I would prefer for central bankers and politicians and these technocrats to have a lot less power uh, I think they just want to, with the reset, they just want to keep a lot of the same things that are happening now. And there's a lot of enormous problems with the system. There's no real rule of law. Uh, basically, there's a huge inflation and tax funnel that the parasites in Brussels, the parasites in Washington, D.C. can siphon a huge chunk of the economy from Main Street over to them. And they're killing the middle class and they're killing Main Street businesses. I would like to see that stop. So we have to raise awareness for more people that, you know, we can't let the people in power blame things on capitalism and then say, oh, we have to reissue new currencies or, oh, we have to go to an SDR. That would be really bad. I do not want to see that. Let me just ask you this, Jason. If we go to this SDR basket of currencies and all those trillions of dollars, they're all overseas. What happens to those dollars? Do they stay overseas? Do they come back to the United States or they what happens to that? Okay, so if there wasn't capital controls put into effect, those uh, those dollars would come back and start to buy up U.S. assets and goods goods here in the U.S. And to a large extent, Dave, that's actually already been happening, really, since the 2008 financial crisis. You've seen an enormous amount of dollars start to come back, and I think that's why uh, you know bond prices are a bit up. That's why we have the Dow over 21,000. That's why we have real estate prices at crazy levels in many major cities. 
since the 2008 financial crisis, there was really only a couple years in a lot of major cities where housing prices were severely depressed. In a lot of major cities, housing prices are right back up. So in some cities, Dave, the housing prices are higher than they were in 2005 and six. So uh, I think those dollars have already started to come back. What can happen though, is if we do have a larger currency crisis, the people in power can block any more dollars from coming back. And then, you know, then it would, then it would be a situation where they would basically, uh, I would not be in favor of this, but I'm just aware that it's probably uh, the people in power want this to happen. They would probably issue a new dollar. And that would be a devaluation at a new exchange rate to whatever currency the people had in their own country who were holding the dollars. They would be forced to trade them in then at a different exchange rate, a new dollar. So if that does happen, what happens here in the U.S.? Does, does that anything change? Uh, I, I think people's standard of livings would drastically decline even faster. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand how the real how the economy really works. And they don't understand about central banks and how much. Uh, government and politicians and bureaucrats can interfere in the economy. So, you know, they would blame the wrong people. This is, look, look I, there are tons and tons of very book smart people who are hardcore Democrat right now on Twitter, despite that there's no evidence, who think Donald Trump is a Russian spy, a technology executive, people with a lot of money, who think that Donald Trump is a Russian spy, who believe that despite that uh, the New York Times issued a retraction recently that 17 government uh, intelligence agencies still have proof that uh, Trump has ties to Russia, that the lie that Hillary Clinton and Podesta created during uh, one of the debates. So there, there, uh, there is a huge divergence in this country now, a huge ideological divergence, Dave. I'm really, really worried about this. I think there's going to be enormous social problems. Uh, this has been building up for decades. People like Antonio Gramsci and George Soros have wanted this. This was their plan. Uh, people are fighting with each other over, uh, you know, they're, di they're being divided by class, race, age, sex. Uh, if you try to have an intelligent discussion with someone else, about about something else, you know, you're automatically a racist or a sexist just for trying to, you know, talk about the U.S. debt or that the, you know, healthcare and Obamacare, even Trump care is bad. Just trying to outline the problems with these things, you get you get called all kinds of names and labels. I think, um, you know, if things don't change in the United States, Dave. In the next decade or so, we are headed for a civil war based on ideology. Not uh, and because people are so freaking brainwashed by what they read in the fake news mainstream media and the fake financial data. And a lot of people still hate, uh, don't like free markets or capitalism. They don't want anyone to earn a profit. So, uh, you know, the country is deeply, deeply divided and it's going to get worse before it gets better based on what I see on social media from a, a lot, a large percentage of Americans. So, um, you know, I, I think I wish the future was going to be better in the short term. I think there's going to be a lot more pain in the short term, not just financially. I think, you know, uh, there's there's even been divorces from families where the husband voted Trump. The wife is, you know, a hardcore feminist and Democrat. And now because the husband voted Trump, the wife is not speaking to the husband. So we're seeing families divided. Uh, there's huge, huge social problems in the United States that uh, a lot of people in our financial space aren't talking about. And because of these ideal, the problems are social and ideological, that's going to make any solution Then it's going to be very difficult to implement a free market solution because there's a large percentage of the U.S. population, Dave, that believes that government is inherently good, that large government is good, government should be larger, uh, government uh, that believes that government tells the truth uh, almost all the time or doesn't think government lies to them. And until this has changed, you know, any type of real solutions long term to the global the global economy are going to be very difficult to implement. Well, you don't think with Trump coming out there trying to show people that CNN, MSNBC and all these different corporate media outlets that they're producing fake news. You don't think he's trying to, like, get the message out. Like, listen, we have a lot of fake news out there. There's a lot of fake reporting. There's this is not real. Do you think he's trying to wake people up to this fact? Yes. The problem, Dave, is he's going to wake some people up. 
The problem is some people don't want to be woken up. This is like the Matrix, uh, like the movie The Matrix. There's a lot of people that don't want to be unplugged. Uh, I can't remember where I read this, but there was a study done talking about how a large percentage of adults, you can give them facts and facts and data showing uh, that they're wrong about certain things. And they will, I think 90% of adults in the survey ignored and still stuck to their own preconceived conclusions. So we have enormous amounts of confirmation bias, herd mentality. People, a lot of people on a lot of different subjects, Dave, have their mind made up. So like I said earlier, a couple minutes ago, there's a lot of very book smart people, even people that are technology billionaires that believe, despite there being no real evidence, that Trump is a Russian spy. So there, until these people's, uh, until they have an open mind, and they can, they're willing to look at different facts until they stop trusting the Washington Post and CNN and the New York Times and MSNBC and the mainstream financial channels, there's going to be huge problems. But uh, so I, I think things, unfortunately, Dave, some people are going to wake up, but not a large percentage of the population. So uh, there's going to be continued social problems, increasing, probably magnifying. And there's huge, huge ideological divides in this country, in the United States. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. And, um, you know, a lot of this, Dave, it's not just the mainstream financial media, uh, mainstream media, although they are a large part of it. I think this starts in the school system. Uh, this really starts with the conditioning starts at a very young age with the kids. So, you know, now they go through government schools, they go through a university with the professor. And so, you know, a lot of them don't have critical thinking and independent thinking. So I think that's why you have people like Ron Paul, who are spending the majority of their time uh, speaking to younger kids, trying to get to them before they become, you know, uh, basically their minds are totally made up adults who ignore facts and, and data. Jason, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? Uh, our YouTube channel has almost 3 million views and uh, almost 20,000 subscribers, so they can go youtube.com slash Wall Street for Main Street. They can also go to our Wall Street for Main Street website. Uh, I'm going to upgrade it in the near future. Uh, they can get on our email address list. I occasionally do write investing research reports. Some of them are for free. Uh, and I will probably be writing uh, paid research reports in the future as well. They can go to wallstreetformainstreet.com. That's W-L-L-S-T-F-O-R-M-A-I-N-S-T.com. Jason, once again, thank you very much for being on the spotlight. You're welcome. And uh, happy Canada Day to your Canadian listeners and uh, happy Fourth of July to your American ones. Good. Thank you too. Thank you.